mysterious. What's the scariest thing you lived through? My dad committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning and I found him. It was scary in that I didn't know what to do. I couldn't logically process at the time he was already dead and I thought I could take some measure and save him. It dealt with nearly the same thing. We had been arguing and he ran off for a walk and I waited a little before walking after him and couldn't figure out where he went. Returned home to find he made it home before me and he was passed out hard. Didn't realize he was overdosing for nearly 10 minutes as he appeared to just be sleeping. Shot him with Narcan twice when he stirred and started speaking incoherently and shaking. The call to 911 was one of the most stressful experiences in my life. Trying to rattle out an address, what's happening, and what my fiancé had possibly taken all while he's gasping for air and turning this sickly pale color and rolling his eyes hard to the back of his head. That was nearly two years ago when he survived the incident and the psychosis that came with the cocktail of experimental drugs he took. Wouldn't wish the cider experience on anyone. I'm glad to hear she survived and it's hopefully all in the past for you aside from some bad memories. Fell asleep driving through the desert after midnight. Woke up after two weeks in a coma, Glasgow coma scale 7, tied down to a hospital bed. The nurse told me that I had tried to get up before. The nurse said that if I fell down, he would be responsible. When I woke from the coma, I was partially paralyzed, and I could not walk, I could barely talk, and I could not use my right arm and right hand. I stayed tied down for another week or two until I was sent to Letterman Army Medical Center. It took a few months until I was able to walk again. Before the accident, I was active duty as Army. I was training for a 20 mile running race, and I was running close to 10 miles per day. I went from being in shape to being unable to walk 20 feet. Luckily I, I was wearing a seatbelt, and I had an airbag. I was medically retired from the US Army. TLDR, don't drive when you are tired. I was on a public transit bus to go to high school one morning. I usually walked, but it was so cold that day. So I'm on a bus, alone, it's like 6am and still dark because of winter. Dude gets in the bus. He could sit anywhere he wanted, he sits right behind me. He grabs my hair and sniffs it with this nasty sounding inhale. Keep in mind I'm 15, and I just hop off the bus and speed walk to my school. He got off and followed me. For this 2 to 3 minutes of walking I kept thinking of what my family would think if I went missing, I got to school safely but yeah I still think about that sometimes. Waiting to find out whether or not my two best friends survived two separate near-death experiences. One was supposed to be at the Pulse nightclub the night of the shooting but cancelled his plans at the last moment. I woke up to headlines about this shooting on my phone the next morning. The other was rescued from a suicide attempt and there was about four hours between her being taken to the hospital and stabilized. Just waiting for hours, sitting by my phone waiting for any news, was agony. I've lived through some traumatizing stuff having a history of childhood sexual abuse, and nothing was worse than the span of time where I thought I'd lost my system of unconditional love and support. My mother's mental illness and delusions when I was a kid. I remember one time when she made me and my sister sleep in bed with her because she saw demons hovering around our bedroom window, trying to get in. I woke up to find her staring down at me and my sister with a butcher knife in her hand. She was smiling but there were tears running down her face. I just closed my eyes and pretended to sleep. Stuff like that, for years of our childhood. When she finally abandoned us, I felt so much guilt at how relieved and happy I felt that she was gone. My parents and I watched out the front windshield as a pickup turned perpendicularly into our lane on the highway, and just stopped. We had no time to really brake or even brace. Bone that sucker, flipping the truck like three times. Somehow everyone was okay. I had a black eye from hitting my face on my knee, an older car with waist seat belts, and some pulled muscles that made it hard to walk for a few days, but somehow everyone made it out fine. The few seconds before impact were definitely filled with terror, but also acceptance that there was nothing that could change what was about to happen. Years later, my brother in his lowered Mazda Miata stopped at a stoplight behind a truck looks in his rear view and sees an SUV coming at him at 60 miles per hour, the driver not looking forward. Because of how low his car was compared to the SUV in the truck in front of him, he figured there was no way the sub wasn't going to end up on top of his car, so he figured that was it for him. 
Somehow his trunk and front end got pancaked, but left him without a scratch. Car accidents are wild. My father is pedophile and, probably, a sociopath. He molested raped my older sister who is now dead, in part because of the trauma. In 2004 he and my mom adopted my sister from China and he touched her from at least age 3. My mom finally got the guts to go to the cops in 2008, she had known since the late 90s what was going on but was terrified of my father who repeatedly told her he would kill her and no one else would love her. After he went to prison her lives just fell apart, my mom was addicted to Valium and just wasn't there for us. Edit for clarity, 10 years later it just feels like I was in one of those CSI shows, except the sociopath from the show is your dad. Please be on the lookout in you family and friends. We had the appearance of a normal American family but in reality there was extreme darkness inside. I am like your sister. I was molested and technically raped by my biological father for two years, ages 14-16. My parents were divorced but I had the fear of not telling anyone because my father was also physically abusive and my stepmother is not quite right in the head. I was afraid she would blame me for breaking up the family and being jealous of her or my half-brother. I do not doubt she did rant like this after it came out. I only said something when it happened to my stepsister. Was still blamed for not coming forward and she was blamed for seducing her mother's husband by her own mother. Nothing came out of it despite both of us pressing charges. Years of CPS visits didn't find it either. We caught on pretty quickly that CPS turns a blind eye to kids in abusive situations when you live in a mansion and grow up upper middle class. Living with my mother would have been just as bad as I suspect she has BPD and has used me as her emotional crutch and personal therapist for as long as I can remember. Over 20 years later, I still have PTSD and PTSD nightmares. It never goes away. My mom came very, very close to falling off a cliff at Canyonlands Natal Park once, that was a terrifying moment. Took us both the rest of the day to recover emotionally, and it turned out she had broken her ankle. At least it wasn't her neck. I also came quite close to committing suicide once. I'm not sure which plan I would have tried, those details are gone from my memory, which is probably for the best, but it was very scary to be in that place and feel so out of control. Obviously I didn't do it, and I'm glad for that now. I was able to stall until the feeling passed, made sure I was around other people. Nothing is quite so final as death, so my other scary experiences don't measure up, on balance. I've also had other brushes with death that didn't feel scary because at the time I couldn't process them enough to be afraid. In the last week I lived with my father, I was 90% sure he would kill my mother, my sister and I at any night with his gun. At Christmas on 2017 he put a hose in his mouth and the other part in the exhaust pipe of his car, no, he didn't try to kill himself, but draw attention. When my mother saw him. She knew it was the last straw and we had to leave the house immediately. The cops arrived one hour later and my father was really drunk. I couldn't sleep that night cause in the hurry I had to leave my cat with him. I cried all night feeling so guilt for leaving him. The next day we went back with people to help us and thanks God, my cat was okay, now he lives with us and I never been happier in my life. My mother divorced him and my sister and I live with her. The last week I spoke to my mother and confessed her I was sure my father would have killed us if we stayed one week more. My mother confessed she was sure he would have killed us if we stayed even less than a week. One day my mom called me telling me, the cops are surrounding your dad's house he's outside in cuffs covered in blood our stepmom and the kids okay, and I went into a panic I drove like a madman my stepmom met me at the home and my siblings were luckily at school my dad had beat my uncle to a pulp and shot him. He's alive praise goodness crime scene wouldn't clean until we cleaned personal belongings, fridge, deep freeze, etc so I took it upon myself to help my stepmom, when we walked in the house it was like a horror film from the kitchen, to the bathroom, to the bloody handprint slid down the door some of it wasn't dried after the 8 hours we sat outside some things were left behind like a bloody splinted chair leg I ended up miscarrying the next day, it absolutely ruined me worse off. My dad I've feared most of my life may get off easy on these charges even as a known felon and repeat offender due to some circumstances, special needs uncle can't recall the story. And uncle was on meth at the time of attack, dad was just drunk as usual however spent years saying he'd kill him if he got the chance as he hated how slow he was. 
One time in high school we had to go on lockdown because there was a gunman in the neighborhood around the school. This was in Florida, and the school was open-walled, I guess you'd say? So like instead of all the classrooms being inside a building that had several doors to the outside, all the classrooms just led to an open hallway. Anyone could just walk right into the school at any point. So that was exciting. We were in one of the only classrooms that didn't have a window, and there was no window in the door either, but there were doors to the two surrounding classrooms, so I dk if we were better or worse off than other classrooms if the shooter actually decided to come on campus. One other negative is this happened like right after A or B period lunch, so the kids who had C period lunch never got to eat because they kept us on lockdown until the end of the school day. One positive is we were in the computer lab so we just got to dick around online to take our minds off possibly dying. We also had a lockdown during college because there was a hostage situation at a restaurant downtown. The college buildings are spread out all over the city, so they just decided to keep us all inside just in case. It's weird, I was way more rattled about that than about being on lockdown in high school with the gunman wandering the neighborhood. It's crazy that this is just basically a fact of life in the US. I'm almost 30. I went through several lockdowns during my school years. Some for little or no reason there's an object in the book drop. What is it? It was a book. Others because there was actually someone with a gun. Someone got shot at my middle school and adult and it was right after hours when kids were getting on buses. When I worked at an elementary school we had to lock down because a man was supposedly coming to kill his six yo daughter. He was arrested down the block. He had a gun. This was just something we live with. Why the fuck? Now my kids are school aged and they still have to live like this. Instead of gun control the schools here have armed police on campus. I went onto the Verak water slide at Sklitterbin. If it sounds familiar it was the water slide that was the tallest water slide in 2014 and was also the same water slide that a young boy died from decapitation. I went on this ride a month before the boy died. So the ride had a narrow raft that had three seats in a single row. I remember sitting on the back of the raft and looking for a seat belt or safety harness only to find out the only thing strapping you in was a Velcro strap that went over one shoulder. That was it. And as soon as we went down the first drop the Velcro strap instantly came undone and I started to feel myself lift out of my seat. Horrified it felt as time moved slowly as I grabbed onto these somewhat loose cheap nylon straps that were supposed to pass his handles but they were so loose that I ended up gripping onto inner material of the raft as hard as I could and agonizing on the fact that I had to go through another drop. The ride itself was less than a minute long but it felt so much longer. Once we reached the bottom of the slide I sat there momentarily stunned at what had just happened and the rest of my family that was waiting at the end of the slide came up to me unaware of what had just happened and was shocked when they saw me still sitting in the raft trembling and tears streaming down my face. When I told my family what happened we informed the lifeguard that was monitoring at the bottom of the slide and they said they would report the raft I was on and inspect it. I was in shock the rest of the time at the water park and didn't go on any other rides after that either. I told as many people as I could about the lax safety precautions that ride had and then a month passed and I saw the incident with the death of the boy on the same ride and instantly got chills. It sunk in that I really could have died the same way that poor boy did if I wouldn't have had a death grip on the sides of the raft. I went through a similar experience, with the bonus of being on a European airline from the country not know for their tact. The plane dropped massively, I can't even describe it, like we were free falling. We lost two engines then, and the pilot announces that as we're halfway between Iceland and England, we're going to try for England. Try. Okay then. I remember someone saying screaming about smoke. Something about another engine. That's when panic hit the cabin. Another drop, this one felt terrible. I remember being in that hunched over position and wondering WTF being jammed between my upright tray table and my two neighbors would even do. The landing was bumpy F like a rock skipping on a lake. We also had the fire trucks and ambulances screaming after us, no jetways to disembark, I think it was a slide? I remember snatches of things, hoses, walking, flashing lights, but it blurs together. They had routed us to a closed part of airport under construction. As a result, there were zero passenger services available as we waited for the airline to figure out WTF to do with us. So we waited, and waited, and waited. And eventually this lady rolled out of a Harry Potter movie with her tea trolley and limp sandwiches, and we waited some more. It was pre-smartphone, 
and the only connection to the outside world was a payphone that took UK money, which no one had, since we weren't supposed to be there. The kicker? Back in destination country not known for tack my family was waiting at the airport and asked the airline where the plane was. Their reply, oh, that flight is delayed because it is on fire. There is an exercise they teach in basic training, or used to anyways, where you train yourself just how long 10 seconds really is and how much you can get done in it. 10 seconds is a very long time in an emergency. Training helps automate a ton of activities and when panic sets, training in muscle memory is the difference between wasting all 10 seconds or being able to accomplish life-saving routines. Even just being able to be aware of how long 10 seconds is, and being able to focus yourself to utilize that time in a panic situation can save your life. Set your watch to beep in 10 seconds. Count it down with your watch. Realize how many times your attention tried to deviate, how long the time felt. Do it again, count with it. Again. Now do it again but this time instead of watching the seconds, get up and do something you do as a routine, make a glass of water, tie your shoes, realize how quick that task actually was. Just the act of counting the seconds can slow down your perception of them and give you focus to accomplish the task at hand. I don't know if that will help, but it's helped me through a lot. I had a jaw infection that doctors and dentists couldn't find for over a year and a half. The infection spread from my jaw, to my nose, to my ears and finally to my brain. They finally found the issue after I collapsed on the streets and they rushed me to the hospital. A dentist had badly removed one of my teeth that left a hole and it got infected. I had to wait three months to get the surgery and they gave me a shitload of medication in the meantime. During the heat wave, not being able to breathe properly, side effects from morphine and antibiotics, severe and constant diarrhea, C. diff infection, blocked nose and blocked ears, all my senses were fucked and I couldn't handle the heat. It was three agonizing months. I was all alone because my immune system was shot. Risk of me getting COVID were high. So nobody came to visit. I was lonely, lost, in pain. Lost 35 pounds. Lost a part of myself. Went insane. Thought about suicide a lot. I'm not sure what kept me going. Maybe because I didn't want my mom to bury her son after burying her husband two years ago. This all happened this year. I got my surgery two weeks ago and it was successful. I'm now slowly trying to get back to a normal life. But those three months have changed me forever. I came seconds away from drowning in the ocean. I was swimming at the beach and wanted to swim out further than the furthest person in the swimming area. I was super close and doing great when suddenly a massive wave came out of nowhere and crashed right on my head, pushing me under. I didn't know which way was up or down. By the time I surfaced, another huge wave crashed down on my head before I could take a breath and I was pushed back under this time spinning around and I had even less clue of where the surface was. I was panicking and trying to find my way up. My chest was screaming and felt like it was going to explode. I felt my subconscious telling me to take a breath and I was frantically telling myself not to do that and hold on just a second more. I was just about to suck in water and drown when I was washed up on shore where I could stand again. I took a breath and started hacking with water pouring out of my nose. I stumbled and collapsed in the sand for a few moments and then dragged myself back to my hotel. None of my family or any lifeguards noticed that I had almost died. I met up with some of my family as I was stumbling across the sand and all I could say is I'm done. I'm done and keep on going to the hotel. When I was in middle school, I went to a friend's birthday party and almost drowned. She had a game with two teams where the goal was for each team to try to get a watermelon over to their side of the pool. I was very, very short at the time, and everyone ended up in the deep end. I got pushed under and couldn't get away from the melee or up to the surface. I was so close to drowning that I went frantic and grabbed at anyone I could, managing to catch my friend's swimsuit and yank myself up. She got mad at me, saying I'd scratched her, completely ignoring that I told her I couldn't get out of the water. Drowning is a terrifying way to go. It and being burned alive are my two only real death fears though it's not anything I think about on the regular. That kind of reminds me of a similar story about my own high school. Nothing at that level, but we had a popular girl in my year level lose her mother in an incident that was a real tragedy and got a lot of press in the city and greater area. About a month later, 
We had to sit through a driver's head assembly and the cops presenting it decided to use that case as an example, and then when the girl ran out crying, they kept drawing attention to her. Worst thing was that some teachers tried to tell the hosts to talk about a different case, but the ones who were organizing the assembly overruled them because they thought it would impact us more. Needless to say, all the kids in my year were pretty pissed at the school for that. I'd rather my school did nothing because somehow they managed to fuck things up further. Every time a student committed suicide, they would make all of us attend a presentation in the school hall, which basically boiled down to don't try to blame the school and say you're stressed because of us. We have counselors you can see. Don't expect any change in homework load because of recent events. Manage your time better and see a counselor if you need to. Good gravy, the sheer audacity to make us gather for a useless presentation saying don't blame us. Every time a student died. Also it was really gross seeing all the popular girls post on social media saying they thought who and who was a great student and a super nice person. For clout probably, because usually the students who killed themselves were either ignored by the popular girls at best, or bullied at worst. My friends and I joked that if you suddenly saw a lot of praise, and good vibes about someone on their social media, it wasn't that person's birthday, it was more likely their funeral. Sorry for my bad English in advance. I was skiing down the mountain. Usual stuff, relaxing turns, fast straight sections. It was one of those straight sections when my ski locked into the trail in the snow. It was deep enough to hold the ski hard enough so no matter how hard I tried to turn or raise it I wasn't able to, without falling. And then I felt it. Feeling of true fear and impending doom. Speed was raising, trail going straight into the tight forest route. Where if you make one mistake you hug the tree to stop and not crash into another. And here I was speed around 90-100 km per hour, real steep track, heavy gear, with one leg leading me straight into the forest my mind went full blank. No memories flashing, no such thing. On other hand I caught feel every drop of sweat coming out of my skin, time slowed to a crawl. And then my mind got to the state of absolute concentration. Adrenaline levels was so high that didn't feel anything. I just thought about turning, and suddenly I did. I got to the resting place, and only now it all hit me at once. Absolute fear, immense headache, pain from twisted leg and dislocated foot. I felt instantly pain wasn't so bad, I broke bones before, but coupled with fear and exhaustion it was too much to hold in. Thanks to kind people I'm now okay. But because of this experience now I seek that feeling of danger and speed. Thanks for your time, hope you'll have a great day. My two-year-old being diagnosed with cancer. Coming up on the third anniversary of his diagnosis and he's still fighting, but every once in a while the knowledge of how quickly it could go south hits me in this like wave of fear and panic and helpless desperation. The day he was diagnosed I took him to his doctor cause he had this black eye that wasn't getting better. She is usually completely unflappable but that morning she panicked and sent me to the children's hospital immediately. That was the worst car ride of my life, because I knew right then and there that our worst fears were true. Fuck cancer. Domestic abuse and gun violence. My ex was on meth and he would get high and go on rampages, and I was usually the only person around. One night I was sitting on the couch and he pointed a gun at me and said I could kill you right now, then he pointed it at the wall and shot the gun. I had no cell phone, no car, and it was winter. I was stuck and he sat there with the gun the whole night, he kept it on his lap while he played video games and I was expected to sit quietly and watch. I've been away from him for almost 8 years now and I'm happy and safe, I've got a wonderful fiancé and I've not spoken to said ex for those 8 years. Trying to talk to every adult in my life for fucking years about what's wrong with me. I needed therapy pretty fucking bad, but everyone I knew were members of my parents extremist right wing church. You could tell these people the darkest shit and they would pray for you. This was the only solution I was ever given until I got kicked out at 17. I'm surprised I survived. My life changed so much when I was in high school and they forced me to see a therapist. Good god I fucking needed that. It's a miracle I never got killed or ended my life during a wave of depression. I had major problems as a kid with zero real guidance. I don't want to go into extreme detail, but I had very violent tendencies never-ending waves of depression, and horrible thoughts. I often look back at who I was and cringe. 
It took years before I finally understood I'm not mentally well and needed to face that problem before I'll ever be able to connect with others socially. HM. Not entirely sure if this fits, but here goes. Some years ago I was in law school and we started covering this one case in class that was pretty horrific. It was a murder that occurred at a local pub I knew. The killer had raped this woman in a bathroom, beaten her with a cast he had on his arm, took her out the emergency exit, dragged her to the beach and left her there on the sand passed out. She did not wake up, the tide came up several hours later, and she drowned. Anyway, I got home and told my mom how we had covered a case that was a murder that took place at the local pub. She quietly asked me the name of the case, I told her, and she started crying. Turns out the victim was her best friend, and my mom was out drinking with her that night. My mom said she headed home a bit early, but her friend wanted to stay. She had some real survivor's guilt around it, wondering whether if she'd stayed with her friend or had insisted that she not stay by herself whether her friend would still be alive. Or maybe that could have been my mum who he grabbed and then I probably would never have ended up being born. I had a period of a couple of years in my mid to late teens where I had sleep paralysis. I only recall experiencing it when napping rather than sleeping at night, and there were no scary monsters or anything, but I'd find myself very much awake but completely unable to move for several minutes. At a guess, this happened around 5-10 times a year from age 15 to 17. Don't recall when it stopped happening, or perhaps it does still happen now and my subconscious just decided it's not worth bothering with being scared about anymore. From reading up about it more, there's a particular body chemistry thing where your body produces a chemical that stops you from moving specifically to prevent you from physically acting out dreams, and sometimes that can go a bit wrong meaning that you can awaken but still be unable to move due to the body still producing the chemical. I just hope I, and you, don't experience it again. At best it's unnerving. And I love napping. I have some good contenders. Driving back from dropping my sister off at college, in New York City, we lived in Florida at the time, the rain started getting heavier and heavier. I mean we lived in Florida, I'm no stranger to crazy downpours, but this was pretty scary. You could barely see anything. The moving van in front of us on the highway almost drove into an exit sign because of the weather. Mum decided we'd pull off into the next rest stop, which luckily was like right there, and just wait until the weather got better. So we're sitting there in our 15-year-old Volvo, rain slamming into the roof, wind howling like crazy, no real place to take shelter, I'm not sure why we didn't go into the rest stop, but I think sometimes when the wind gets bad you're better off in your car. Anyway, come to find out the next day that crazy weather was a fucking hurricane. It was the 2005 Gaston and we were just sitting in the car waiting it out. Another scary, this was in 2019. We're road tripping across the country. Sky gradually turns a weird, ominous dark color. Of course the sun is going down, but it's also getting stormy. The wind is picking up. Mom is using up all her energy to basically keep the car going straight. The original plan was for us to spend the night in Sioux Falls, and if you remember that I said 2019 and I'll add this was September, you might know where this is going. It's just crazy wind, creepy dark sky. All signs point to bad weather ahead. We stop for the night just outside of Mitchell, deciding the weather is just too risky to take the extra time to get to Sioux Falls for the night. We're not in a hurry so it's fine if we're off the itinerary slightly. So we're in this Koa cabin, which is one room, with wind and rain just pounding like crazy. It feels just like when we were huddled for safety during Gasson. But this can't be a hurricane. Three tornadoes three tornadoes hit Sioux Falls that night. We were far enough out of the way we didn't get tornado level wind, but it was still scary as shit being in a little wooden cabin with winds howling and then finding out that basically if you'd been two hours ahead of schedule you might have died. Here's a blurry photo I took of the sky from the passenger seat before it got real bad and I know it looks like a funnel cloud forming, but I swear to god I didn't see that when I took the picture originally. I think it's just a weird coincidence. I could go on forever, but I think my scariest thing is getting dragged by a bus. Like, not insulting by one. Had band practice at school so I had to take the city bus home. Got my big ass backpack on. Bus stops, I make my way to the back exit. My foot moves off the step. Bus starts moving. I am moving with it. The back door must have shut on my backpack. 
So I've got this weird combination of panic and blankness going on. I can't think any thoughts, but I start grabbing for the bus stop pole, as if I can just hold on to the sign and stop the bus that way. I can't really describe what a weird, empty, terrifying feeling it is to basically be hanging on the side of a bus with nothing to grab onto while the bus is moving along. I think that's the closest I've ever come to thinking oh shit, I'm gonna die with something that didn't involve my regular health issues, like how my heart just stops sometimes. Luckily there were other people on the bus, and I think they must have noticed and got the driver to stop. I actually didn't go too far, but I mean I think any length is too far to get basically dragged by a bus. So the bus driver didn't offer anything, I don't know what he could have offered, but something wouldn't been nice. I literally could have died if things had gone worse. I skinned my wrist in a gnarly way and hurt my ankle pretty bad, but other than being immensely traumatized I was okay. I couldn't use the rear exit on a city bus for like 12 years, and it still makes me nervous to this day. Almost dying on a riding lawnmower as a kid. I don't even like saying almost dying because I definitely should have died. Tried to get fancy and save myself time with the weed worker by driving the mower halfway under a wooden playset with swings, and then back out and continue mowing the yard. I was the shortest kid in my whole school, like 4 foot 9 in 7th grade, which is why I could barely reach the lawn mower brake pedal. Drove halfway under the playset with the platform for the slide being at about chest level while I was on the mower. Slowly, I lost control of the mower moving forward and couldn't see or reach the brake pedal or put the mower in reverse. My neck was completely pinned between the firm mower seat and the wooden playset platform as I scrambled to push the brake. Normally, the mower shuts down automatically when there is no weight on the seat, but since there was so much pressure from my collarbone neck being pressed against the mower seat, it continued pushing forward with force. This was it. I knew I was going to die as I felt my lungs lose air and neck getting forcefully squeezed between a machine and solid wooden structure. Somehow, one of the low-hanging flimsy kitty swings latched onto the front end of the mower and flipped it upwards, launching my almost lifeless body backwards onto the ground as the blade chopped both swings to shreds and the mower power down. My dad came outside only to see my purple body laying on the ground and the riding mower completely inverted and our swing set in shambles. Never had to mow the lawn ever again. So I have a few, my sister's huge ex-BF got blackout drunk and told us he was going to kill us, two small 100 pounds girls, and then himself. Talked about how our spines would break when he threw us off the balcony. Police showed up and never followed up like they said they would, only reported a mental health crisis. We couldn't get the PFA to get him off the lease and have to live with him after that. I was house sitting when someone tried to break in. I was young and terrified. Luckily the German Shepherd scared them off. My car was in the driveway and there weren't curtains in the living room, they knew I was in there. I didn't even call the police I froze. Almost getting hit head on in the car, one lane of traffic each way and no shoulder, a ditch on each side. I was honking and trying to decide to drive into the ditch and the other driver got back into their lane with inches to spare. My mom threatened to kill my sister in her sleep with a metal baseball bat, talked about how much blood there would be. There was a metal bat in the house and we weren't allowed to have locks on our doors. Never slept well until I had my own place. I'm sure there's more my life has been a weird one. Driving down the interstate a wheel and tire came off a trailer that was hauling a load of junk. When it did it bounced a couple times and then shot straight at us like a rocket had been aimed at me. Time slowed down and there was no possible way to avoid it and I didn't want it to hit my wife so I jerked red wheel as much as I could in such a short time so it would miss her and go through my head when it hit and then just waited knowing my time was up. By doing that I got the car at an angle and while my windshield still got shattered, the roof took the brunt of the hit and kept the wheel from going all the way through. My Lexus was totaled but other than a few small cuts my wife and I walked away without any major injuries. I do still have flashbacks that keep me awake sometimes though.